So I was asked to give a 10 minute presentation talking about my background in science. I started putting it together and it felt somewhat self-indulgent, but also felt a little dry. So I decided to uh, give it a bit more excitement by absolutely slathering it in Star Wars references. So just like George Lucas giving an unnecessary amount of boring backstory, I will start very much at the beginning where I got my undergrad in Cardiff University. So this was a genetics degree. Um, which was going great, and I kind of got the influence of uh, bioinformatics towards the end of my second year, and so for my final year project, I decided to go straight into that. I was working on a uh, Sanger transcriptomics project, looking at freshwater amphipods, uh, building a transcriptome and um, computational database and visualization packages to try and explore this data. That really kind of got me the bug of doing uh, more bioinformatics and next-gen sequencing, um, because as we all know with a next-gen sequencer it is very much a new hope. So I knew I wanted to come back and do more in the way of science but I had some time off after finishing uh, very much out in the desert. I went and I taught in China, I was teaching English over there for a while, I started working with the NHS blood and transplant in the labs so got a little bit of experience there and then I got the uh, order from who later went to become my PhD supervisor, uh, Professor Pete Kill saying that a PhD opportunity was coming up and whether I'd want to interview for it. So then I was ready to uh, jump in uh, and see what was going on. So my PhD project was on the earthworm microbiome. We, this was mainly us going out into the field, and, or swamp, pulling out some worms and then cutting them open and sequencing what was on the inside. We was mainly looking to see how the bacterial communities change from the inside of an earthworm to the outside. Uh, the inside of a worm is very different to the outside, got a lot more organic compounds, uh, the oxygen is it's almost totally anoxic versus the soil which is variable, and much more moisture and a more neutral pH. So we knew these conditions were there, not been a lot of um, evidence that the bacteria is different, we wanted to look at it with a next-gen sequencing approach. Um, went to various sites across the UK and internationally, um, looking for heavy metal contamination and exposures to see how that affected these microbial communities. One such was on uh, the Azores Islands and if you don't know what the Azores are they're basically like a less evil version of Mustafa um, but only slightly less evil if the some areas if you just lay down on the ground for 10 minutes you would actually die based mm -hmm. on the level of CO2 so it's quite a toxic environment that we wanted to investigate. Um, and then as we went through we could see actually very different microbial communities in different conditions these were only within very local spatial, only within a couple of kilometers of each other, but microbial communities are changing in response to some heavy metals and such. So we want to look deeper. We want to see what actually is going on beneath the surface. Because as we all know, something that might look as natural and simple and uh, monophyletic could actually be something much more complicated, or even if you go beneath the scenes, even more so. So this is where the voxel worm project kind of came from. This is where, it, um, just like yeah, Madame Proxima, watch Solo, Better Than the Last Jedi, don't at me, um, took a long, the length of the worm and chopped all the way along the length to look how the microbial communities change along the way. And looking at individual organs, such as you would do with the human microbiome project, you wouldn't expect a gut bacterial community to be uh, totally the same as a skin microbial community or other organs. But even though that, an earthworm is just a tube, maybe there's not much going on on the inside. But actually what we find is diversity and richness changes along the length. And we also see changes in the microbial communities. For example, individual populations in the um, foregut, like the crop and the gizzard, and even in the hindgut uh, we see distinct microbial communities. Just like you'd see with things like termites, uh, ostax worms which um, eat on whale fall in the ocean, or things like a rancor, probably. Um, so I was finishing my PhD and was interested in going forward with bioinformatics, maybe stepping it up, doing something a bit more computational full time. And so I got into my postdoc. So thinking I'm the seasoned pro now, ready to start doing some serious uh, bioinformatics, what you learn very quickly is as a bioinformatician, a lot of it is sat, sat in the corner, being a bit of a hermit, plonking away on your own thing and going mad. So what I was actually working on was uh, chromatin seek. Um, or MNA seek as we can also call it. So very much like the Praetorian Guard wields his lofty chain of linked things, it's kind of like chromatin. We have the uh, DNA strand wrapped around the nucleosomes going out throughout the genome. 
holding the uh, holding the DNA in place, but also it's controlling um, can be controlling expression, controlling stability, and how the actual interactions with the DNA goes forward. So what we do is we use a micrococcal nuclease. We digest down the chromatin into nucleosomes, multinucleosome regions, or subnucleosomes. It can be transcription factors and initiation complexes. Um, throw it into an Illumina sequencer, paired end, so that also allows us to um, measure the size of these particles. If they are long, double wrapped around a nucleosome, 150 bases, or smaller than that, which could be down to 120, down to 80 or below. Um, and then we can map it back onto the genome. Now that we have a map of the entire genome, we know exactly where we can look, and we can look for these islands of stability in the genome, and then this is the kind of thing we find. So we see individual and nucleosome positionings like these, we see overall chromatin traces, and things like these subnucleosomal sizes, which look very much like ChIP-seq, um, but without an immunoprecipitation, selecting only certain regions, but we can see these positions where small particles are binding and protecting the DNA and very much in a transient state that we see. The data is quite complex. It looks something like this, where we uh, actually, along this um, axis, is size. So we're seeing all the different sizes of particles, even though we see the standard mononucleosome traces along here. Subnucleosomal particles of various sizes and open regions that don't have these things binding. So then this is all the theory. We want to see what the actual biology looks like. Um, I work in Arabidopsis thaliana, a lot of experiments on using this technique, spoiler, um, have been with um, yeast and human and a lot of other species. The first study we actually looked at in this case was light versus dark. This was before I even got attached to the project, so I had no way of Star wars -ifying the whole thing. Um, actually looking at how the microbial, sorry, how the chromatin structure was aligning, this was looking at the subnucleosomal particle binding at transcription start sites. So in the bottom right quadrant, we see genes that are in higher expression in light grown plants, and um, correlating with the greater accumulation of subnucleosomal particles at transcription start sites. So the initiation complexes and the binding of transcription factors causing that, and the inverse in the dark grown plants. You can also see things like this, where if we look at a single gene, this is MPQ4 or photosystem subunit two, and along the length here is the 150 base pair single nucleosomes and the smaller particles here you can see the differences between the light grown and the dark grown. So we can see actually on a gene by gene basis how the changing in the chromatin is responding to environmental factors which was a pretty novel uh, finding. We can also do things like this. So these two uh, charts are a pile up of 2000 PIF3 uh, transcription factors or um, 20,000 PIF4 transcription factors based on the binding sites. So, and what we can see is the difference between the light and the dark, we see greater accumulation of these subnucleosomal particles. So basically we're seeing the binding of the transcription factor in real time by taking the samples and processing them the way we do. What's quite interesting about these are, um, they are based, these are um, translationally controlled transcription factors, which means they are, you don't see differences in the RNA expression. So RNA-seq or qPCR, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between uh, PIF3s or PIF4s actions in these cases, but we can see it using this technique um, and something that we've uh, tuned over the last few years. One other experiment um, which I'm currently still working on um, is looking at the cell cycle. This is as close as I could get to a cycle in Star Wars canon. If that's not true, don't at me. Um, uh, cyclin D31 overexpressor is one of the thing is the main one we're working on. So changing between the wild type and uh, this, what we see is quite a big difference between um, the normal growth and a much reduced differentiation of the plant. So um, it has this huge effect. We want to look at how that affects the chromatin uh, based on this, uh, based on these um, gene modification. What we do see is this blue line is the wild type. We see a nucleosome-free region directly upstream of the transcription start site. That's pretty typical, that's what we expect to see in all chromatin-based studies. What we find in the overexpressor is a massive change in chromatin structure. We see um, this is an average of every single gene in the Arabidopsis genome. We see a much different accumulation at this point, and as the nucleosome-free region kind of implies, it should be free of nucleosomes, but we're seeing a lot of genes where this is changing. Um, I started drilling into that, trying to look at how this is changing. We see certain clusters of where this nucleosome is sitting in this region. And then what I'm looking at at the moment is seeing 
how it changes, which genes change, where a nucleosome goes from one position to another, and what groupings that's together. So that's kind of where I'm at with um, research in a very fast and uh, broad overview. But I wanted to talk quickly about the extras, the other stuff that I've done along the way, I'm sure everybody else has. You have things, maybe they seem not the greatest projects, say things you do on the side, they kind of get in the way, you kind of wish you didn't have to deal with them because they're just ruining the main reason why you're doing this. But then you realise maybe only years later that actually it's much more important, you learn so much through it, maybe there's a much bigger reason for why you're doing all these things. Darth Jar Jar is a whole story, I will tell literally anybody about it for hours later, trust me. So. Um, one of the things I was doing was working with the Environment Agency. This was to build a pipelining tool and visualization system in a very you know, basic way for them to look up freshwater diatoms to see how um, changes between them based on molecular techniques rather than microscopy could be uh, used to look at river, river health. Uh, so this was a package called Prompt, um, which really kind of gave me a lot of experience in doing pipelining and bioinformatic tools and doing some visualizations, although um, I mean they've been surpassed these days by much more advanced packages, but that was a good single project to work on on myself. And that was about six months uh, throughout my PhD off and on. Also I do a lot of work with the biocomputing hub here in Cardiff, uh, and very much like the archives at Scarif, we uh, have a lot of computing power, resources, storage, so anybody who's interested in taking up some more bioinformatics using a much more powerful computers. We have huge servers. So rather than having that one little box in the corner of your office, uh, access the servers. We've got terabytes of worth of RAM, hundreds of CPUs, and so you can do much more. And it's this that's really kind of taken me to the next level, what I'm gonna be doing next and um, going forward. Uh, so, well, as I say, next, or to mix memes momentarily, next generation. Um, so I'm starting up now as the bioinformatician for the Cardiff University School of Biosciences. This is, um, well, this is an artist's impression of me from next month. Basically anybody who is interested in doing some, um, who wants some bioinformatics and um, time on their project, it either can be written into a grant or, um, or we can work out something else in terms of maybe short term if you have some RNA-seq or you have an experiment that wants doing and you need somebody for a few weeks on a project. I can do that, or helping writing grants, or basically all your bioinformatics needs. We do drop-in sessions that are just come, ask some questions, maybe get points in the right direction for any bioinformatics he needs. Um, and the other thing is doing some uh, training courses, because a lot of people come to me and say, we want to learn how to RNA-seq or ChIP-seq or just generally using Linux skills on the server. And that's something that uh, can bring together, do some kind of courses. so. Um, not courses in a grand sense, perhaps, but learn how to do this, get on and do those first few steps to really get to grips with your own data um, and do this again in the future. So anybody who's interested in that can come, come talk to me about this or anything else. If you have any questions about Star Wars, I'm up for that. Science, sure, I mean, I guess so, but uh, yeah, that's me. Thanks.